Hi, it's Monday, September the 23rd, and I continue to read and wonder my way through the book of Deuteronomy. And today we're in Deuteronomy chapter 2, verses 16 to 25. Um, and uh, Israel, the people are uh, in the wilderness. God sent them out into the wilderness because, because they would not basically invade uh, the Amorites on faith. God said, go and take them. Go, go, go and, and, and take their land. Uh, and they were, the, uh, Israel was cautious. And so they sent some people ahead. They looked, they saw, they said, I don't think we can do this. And they were reluctant and afraid. Uh, and then God was angry at them. So they said, oh my gosh, we don't want you angry. So then they went and attacked and God said, don't attack now. Cause I'm not with you. Uh, and they attacked and they lost. And God basically was fed up with them, not doing it on faith, but wanting to basically put their own judgment ahead of God's. And so God said, you know what? go back out in the wilderness and just wander around for 38 years. So that's basically what they've done, and that's where we pick it up. So uh, Deuteronomy 2, 16 to 25. Just as soon as all the warriors had died off from among the people, the Lord spoke to me saying, Today you are going to cross the boundary of Moab at Ar. And when you approach the frontier of the Ammonites, do not harass them or engage them in battle. For I will not give the land of the Ammonites to you as possession because I have given it to the descendants of Lot. It also is usually reckoned as a land of Rephaim. Rephaim formerly inhabited it, though the Ammonites called them Zamzumim, a strong and numerous people as tall as the Anakim. But the Lord destroyed them from before the Ammonites so that they could dispossess them and settle in their place. He did the same for the descendants of Esau, who live in Seir, by destroying the Horam before them so that they could dispossess them and settle in their place even to this day. As for the Avim, who have lived in settlements in the vicinity of Gaza, the Kaftorim, who came from Kaftor, destroyed them and settled in their place. Proceed on your journey and cross the Wadi Arnon. See, I have handed you over. I have handed over to you King Sihon of. Excuse me. See, I have handed over to you King Sihon, the Amorite of Hezbon, and his land. Begin to take possession by engaging him in battle. This day I will begin to put the dread and fear of you upon the peoples everywhere under heaven. When they hear report of you, they will tremble and be in anguish because of you. Sorry for that little slip up. I hope you can appreciate lots of words we don't say very often. Um, not to mention saying Amorite and think, wait, is that the Ammonites? Ammonites and Amorites aren't the same. God's told Israel, told Moses to tell them, don't attack the Ammonites. No, they're they're descendants of Lot. We're not we're not giving, we're not going there. Um, but the Amorites, I certainly hope Moses was listening carefully and didn't attack the wrong people. Um, so I'm not sure what to make of this. Um, I mean, I know what some folk will make of it. Uh, I already commented last time uh, on uh, the way that God uses time. So basically, you know, they're out wandering the wilderness until those warriors who refuse to invade based on God's word um, and then and then try to make up for it by invading even when God told them not to, uh, they're gone. Basically, we've waited until they've died off. Just as soon as all the warriors had died off from among the people, the Lord spoke to me saying. So the idea, I think, is that they are now a more faithful people because those unfaithful are gone. That's worth wondering about a little bit sometimes. And I know that's not what this is about, but is does a community become faithful if they get rid of the people who are not being faithful? Do I become more faithful if I stop asking questions? And it has been suggested to me that, yes, I am more faithful if I don't ask questions. And I know people who pursue, pursue their faith exactly that way. They don't ask questions. When something comes up that doesn't make sense to them, they want to ask of their, their God, of their religion, of their leaders, why are we doing this? I don't understand. It doesn't make sense. They are told, yes, but that's God's mystery. Who are you to understand what God's doing? Um, fair enough. Fair enough kind of words that, that God speaks to Job in the book of Job. Where were you, uh, you know, when I created the universe? Like, what do you know? <laughs> um, so you could argue, I suppose, and some do, that 
um, being faithful is to stop asking questions. I obviously don't believe that. I believe that faith is about engagement and that does come with questions. I ask questions. God asks questions of me too. And there's an engagement and there takes a time of discernment so that I can discern what God is asking of me and and I can express to God what I am wondering about and questioning. And I mean, that's why I like doing it in community um, because very often I hear the word of God emerge from other people. They say things that have never occurred to me and it, there's a sense of, oh, this is what's right. This is right. This is what God's talking about. Yeah. But I need to hear it from somebody else. I need a, another perspective to be engaged. So, so I don't believe that a lack of questions indicates a greater faith. And that's not exactly what they're saying here. But if you have a community and you're saying the community is unfaithful, so we're just going to wait till those doubters die and then we'll be faithful. I question that. That's, I don't know, faith by default. At least we're not attack, attacking uh, the Amorites anymore. Um, you know, uh, that must be faithful. No, you, you, you got beat. Uh, and then God sent you back to the wilderness. So you're just sort of basically doing as you're told. Um, but I don't know that there's anything faithful there. You couldn't beat the Amorites anyway. Right? They, they slapped you around uh, like a rented mule. Sorry for that expression, but you know, I needed something. Um, so that's hardly faithful. Uh, it's not faithful for me. If I, if I go to church every Sunday, I say, well, look at me. I'm very faithful. I go to church every Sunday. Well, yeah, I go because if I don't go, there's somebody who will beat me. That's not faith. That's not faith. That's just, I don't like getting beaten. Um... They're wandering out in the desert. That's not faith. They're, they're afraid to go and fight with anybody. They got badly beaten by the Amorites. They would have lost fighting stock, soldiers. They got these ones. They're waiting for them to die off because they, they're, they're obviously not good tacticians because <laughs> uh, they didn't listen to God. And then when they decided to follow their own, they were badly beaten. So... So I'm invited, to, for me anyway, to wonder what makes a faith community, an actual faith community, what makes a good faith community, what makes me faithful. Is it the things that I don't do? You know, all those, the, all those thou shalt not commandments. Am I faithful because I didn't kill anybody today? Oh, that normie's so faithful. Hasn't murdered anybody in like a month. Really? That doesn't feel faithful. Hasn't committed adultery. Oh, he's so wonderful. Hasn't stolen. Oh, so great. He didn't lie. He's so faithful. Frankly, those to me are just basic, decent things. I mean, that's a really low bar. I would like to think that my faith is revealed in the times that I risk and I try a little harder. Uh, in the people that I help. You know, whether that's with my gifts or somehow I'm part of them connecting to God and finding their way. I mean, that to me is faith. Faith for me is risk when, when I do the thing that God wants me to do, even though there's a part of me thinking, I don't think this is going to work. I don't think I don't think I can help that person at all. Their need is too great. I, I don't I'm not I don't want to be anywhere near them. And yet God says, go, Norm, and you go and it's something happens, and whatever it is that happens, it's better than if you hadn't gone at all. It may not be perfect, it may not be great, but it's better than nothing happening. And that, to me, is faithful. And this made me wonder about that a little bit. Um, a point I made last time, uh, and I stand by it, is that uh, God isn't just for Israel. Right, God is also um, protecting the Ammonites, um, saying, "Don't, don't, don't go for them. Um, don't, don't attack them, and uh, you know, leave them alone." Also, the uh, descendants of Seir, like, no, 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 we're not going to attack them. Um, I've got the place that I want you to go, and that's what's going to happen. And so, so I appreciate the fact that God is not just for Israel. And I think last time I talked a little bit about chosen people and what that means. Um, so I'm not going to do that again. 
Um, but the idea is that God is for all people. But you read this, go, yeah, and then what I read in this is that God has told them to now go and invade the Amorites, okay? Knock off King Sihon, the Amorite of Heshbon, uh, and, uh, and take his land, because God's given it to you. I mean, you, you, they still have to fight a, bat a battle, but God's given it to you. Uh, and one thing God's also now done for you is, is put, the, 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 put dread and fear into, into the peoples. Um, so that they are now afraid of Israel. They didn't have any reason to be afraid of them before, uh, but apparently now they're going to be afraid. Um, when they hear a report of you, they will tremble and be in anguish because of you. Um, I, I want to question God a little on that one, frankly. Um, not because I lack faith, but because I, I have a lot of faith. So I need to ask these questions. So God, the idea then is that you're going to make um, people afraid of Israel. Now, I did wonder about it before. Um, Israel are the chosen people. You called them that. And, and as I've come to understand that chosen isn't favorite. Chosen is these are the people who will reveal God to the world. If you want to understand God's will, if you want to understand God's character, look to these people. They will reveal it to you. So is God saying, I want people to be afraid of me? When I mean, and I mean mortally afraid. I don't mean a fear to the Lord, like seeing God in awe. I mean terrified of the punishment if we do not comply. Is that really what God wants? Because I got to tell you, God, I, I'm, not, I'm not finding that, that that's really helpful. The people who have actually brought me to faith were not people of whom I was afraid ever. It was people that I admired and people that I could approach, people who took the time to to share their faith with me and and, and listen to me and hear my story and and then share their story with me and find the common points and find the moments of inspiration where we could see, you know, learn from each other. And like that's that's Faith, not fear. So I need to question that, God. I need I need a little understanding of that. Um, and as I say, there there are those who, who read this and they say, well, there you go. And that's proof that God has sent Israel into the promised land, into Gaza, actually, um, into, you know, that whole area. And, and, and so you... You, you, you hear them say, well, you see, God's given them that land, so whoever's there now, too bad, they have to get out. God gave it to them. It's God's will. And there are those who are fighting for their land uh, by any means necessary because they believe that it is God's will. And it's passages like this that do inspire that, right? Because God says, don't attack those people. Don't attack those people. Go this way. Attack that one. So it says God is directing Israel and telling them what land to take. And now, you could argue about you know what land is intended. Uh, is it an overreach? Is it an underreach? Although you can all there's lots of discussion to be had, but I struggle with that fundamental understanding that God has said go and take this land. And why is that? And what's left? I struggle with that because. And this may put me at odds with Deuteronomy. It may put me at odds with God. I don't know. It might put me at odds with faith. I'm not sure. I struggle with that, though, because I believe that God wants peace and God's will to be known uh, around the world and, and wants that peace to abide and that will to direct us. I believe that. I don't think God's will is followed. I don't think peace abides when people live under threat of violence under threat of punishment, under threat of being extinguished from reality. I don't think that works. Now, where was I at the beginning of the universe? I know I don't know it all. Uh, I have just my, you know, my, my brain, my capacity to understand. And no, I can't understand all things that are divine uh, with my limited ability, but it just is fundamentally a challenge for me. 
God, to me, is, is, is revealed so perfectly in Jesus, and Jesus doesn't invade anybody. Jesus has lots of opportunity to go into battle, doesn't go into battle. Yes, you could have the vision of the, you know, the, the vision of Revelation, but that's not, that's not Jesus um, uh, pre-crucifixion. That's a vision of John's understanding of, of what he wants from Jesus. Um, so I think it says more about what he wants but the more it says about Jesus. So the Jesus that I know from the Gospels is not colonial does not go imposing his will or God's will, but is invitational. And so that when people embrace it, they own it themselves. They're not, they're not acting in a faithful manner because they are afraid of the punishment. So I find it hard to reconcile my understanding of, of, of God through Jesus, my understanding of faith that actually takes root my experience of faith that takes root, I find that intention, I won't say in, 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 incompatible, because um, I don't know all things, but it, it's certainly intention with this idea that God says, don't fight them, don't fight them, go fight him. Um, I, I just find it difficult. But what I do take away from this passage is that area, whole area, an area that we have called at different times the Middle East, um, but we look at it as Israel, Palestine, Gaza is included in that, that whole area um, thousands of years ago was a place of war and conflict, right? That's what we're hearing here. Um, Esau's descendants destroyed the Horam who were there. The Horam were in the land, Esau's descendants came uh, and took them. The Ammonites uh, were there. Uh, or the Rephaim um, were there, and um, and 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 yet um, the descendants of Lot um, came in and and, and, and took them out. Um, the uh, the Amorites came in and they took the land, and now Israel's going to take the land from them. This is an area where people are forever at war, forever taking from each other. Um, which doesn't mean I'm complacent and satisfied with that. But, you know, when I look at what's happening in those areas right now and the war that goes on, I look and I realize thousands of years we've been battling over this land. Thousands of years. Am I surprised we haven't solved it yet? I'm not surprised. I'm a little discouraged, though. And maybe we'll get it eventually. Maybe we will. But the thing is, when this letter, when this or this book of Deuteronomy was written, it was still land under siege, um, disputed territories all over the place. And it has been that way for millennia since. The more things change, the more things stay the same. Um, I'm not sure how that makes me feel. Um, on one hand, I guess there's a part of me that says, Man, God, if this is your holy land, would you just would you clean it up? And God saying to, to me, to us, well, this is our holy land. This is your holy land. Why don't you clean it up? Because um, I think sometimes we're not actually listening to God. I don't think God wills it to be a place of war, but it always has been. Why is that? Is it because nobody has tried something other than war? Because again, I'm one of those people who believes that war leads to more war. Um, yeah, I don't know what to make of it. But I think I'm going to leave it alone for now. Leave it with you to wonder about and I'm simply going to offer a prayer. So let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for the opportunity to ask questions. And even when there are more questions than there are answers, we still give thanks. We give thanks for the opportunity to listen and hear your voice. 
hear your word emerge. God, as we hear your word, may we be drawn to your word. May we grow in faith. We pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's enough for me now. I didn't do nearly enough with this passage, but um, but I did enough for me right now. I got some things to think about, so I'm going to do that. And, uh, and I hope I get to see you tomorrow. Until I get to see you, God bless. Please know that God sees you exactly as you are, exactly where you are. Whether you have all the answers or all the questions or some of both, God sees you and loves you as you are. But God's love doesn't just stop with you, it moves through you out into the world. That's what it is to be blessed. You are blessed and in that you end up blessing the world because God's love moves through you. So thank you for being you, for sharing God's love with the world. And I uh, hope to see you tomorrow. God bless.